Good afternoon. Good to see you. Welcome. You can see that fulfillment window is well lit up up there, looking good. That usually also means that the pulpit will be well lit up for the next uh, 15 minutes. I have to time it just right when I get up on the pulpit. Uh, we'll be Jonah without the shade. Maybe in the future we'll schedule this for 11.30 or 12.30. But then it's in a different time of the year and it's not quite the same time frame. So, the heck with it. Hmm. So we come to the Lord today with our cares as well as our joys. Please stand. O oh Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from the 59th chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the first verse. See, the Lord's hand is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God, 
and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. For our transgressions before you are many, and our sins testify against us. Our transgressions indeed are with us, and we know our iniquities, transgressing and denying the Lord, and turning away from following our God, talking oppression and revolt, conceiving lying words, and uttering them from the heart. Lord, have mercy on us. The epistle reading is from 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he might exalt you in due time. Cast all your iniquity, anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, strengthen, and establish you. O Lord, have mercy on us. taken from the Gospel according to the Apostle Luke, chapter 22, verse 54 and following. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then the servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else, on seeing him, said, You are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man... I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O Lord, do I 
put my trust. Leave me not, O oh Lord my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O oh Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Please be seated for the message. Grace and peace to you this day from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So this sermon is based on a modern translation of this text in Luke. So, the evening had absolutely run off the rails. It had started off so well, the camaraderie of being with his friends, the warmth of their fellowship, the joy of being with their master and hearing all that he had to say it was all wonderful. One of those moments that just kind of freeze in your memory and make you happy just to think about them. But it started to slip when Jesus made that comment about one of them betraying him. That sent a ripple through the group. The men looked with suspicion on one another, wondering who would do such a thing. Oh, and then the argument about who was the greatest. So immature. As usual, though, Jesus turned it into a teachable moment. He said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise leadership over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. He encouraged them to do everything upside down. Let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. That's Jesus Christ's pecking order. For Peter, it really got awkward when Jesus leaned over with a troubled look on his face and said that Satan had demanded him. But Jesus had prayed for him. Peter was aghast. Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. But Jesus knew better. He said that Peter would three times deny that he even knew Jesus. And if that weren't enough to completely wreck the evening... When they went to the Mount of Olives for Jesus to pray, the disciples fell asleep while they were waiting. They couldn't help it. They were just worn out after everything that had gone on, and they were still trying to process what Jesus had said was coming. But then it got worse. There were soldiers. Judas had led them in, and the chaos that followed was unbelievable. That servant of the high priest got his ear cut off in the melee, but Jesus shut it down. He even healed the man's ear. Didn't matter. They arrested him anyway, dragged him to the high priest's house, and Peter couldn't help himself. He followed. He had to see what was going to happen, had to do something even if it was just to follow along and see it for himself. And as he stood in the courtyard, Peter could see Jesus with the council inside. Didn't sound like it was going very well at all. In fact, Jesus was barely talking. He just kind of stood there and took it. Peter had moved close to the fire to warm himself, but he wasn't really paying attention to what was going around him. His attention was laser-focused, on what was going on inside, he didn't notice the girl sitting next to him studying his face intently until she finally blurted out, this man was also with him. Peter jumped. He turned to her, and for the first time, he took stock of where he was. He looked around at the crowd gathered in that courtyard and realized that these folks weren't all that friendly to his group of friends, he hoped to shut the girl down without drawing further attention to himself. He looked at her and quietly said, Oh no, miss. I don't know him. That seemed to satisfy her. So he returned to watching the events unfold inside. 
that was more arguing. Raised voices, accusations being shouted across the room. Peter shivered. He wasn't sure whether it was from the cold or from a sense of foreboding. That pesky woman had moved on. But a young man had taken her spot and was looking at Peter. You're one of them too, aren't you? Peter was irritated. He needed these people to quit interrupting his concentration. He was trying to hear what was happening to Jesus inside. Man, I am not. The young man seemed to take that at face value, walked away, although Peter noticed him a little later whispering with a group of men off in the corner of the courtyard. Still, his eyes were riveted on Jesus and the proceedings inside. Time passed. It was late at night or maybe even early in the morning now. Peter had lost all track of time. He couldn't tell exactly what was happening, but it wasn't good. A lot of yelling. The high priest had been carrying on for a while and was obviously agitated. That's when it happened. From across the courtyard, the voice rang out. As soon as the man began speaking, Peter knew it was about him. He was standing and pointing at Peter. I'm telling you, this guy was with him. I heard him talking earlier, and he is definitely from Galilee. His accent gives him away. All eyes turned to Peter. He wasn't sure how to react, what to say, what to do. What if they realized he really was with Jesus? Would they arrest him too? He didn't know. Didn't want to find out. He figured if he responded aggressively, maybe they would stop saying it. Man, I do not know what you are talking about. He spit each word out in turn, hoping his accuser would just back down. The courtyard grew quiet. Peter heard that rooster crowing in the distance. He then just glared at his accuser for a while and then turned to see what was going on inside again. It was like Jesus knew what was happening outside, even though he was up to his neck with the council inside. Slowly, he turned and made eye contact with Peter. His eyes were sad, accusing. And Peter remembered what he had said about him denying three times before the rooster crowed. Tears welled up in Peter's eyes as he pushed through the crowd. He had to get out of that place. He couldn't face Jesus after what he had just done. He was so embarrassed, so lost. What did this all mean? How often do we do the same thing? Fail to acknowledge our faith in public because we're scared of how people, our friends, might react. Or join the crowd in mocking another believer because we don't want to be seen as different. We deny the one who died for our sins without even realizing we've done it. We don't. And then when we do see it, the guilt can be overwhelming. It may be hard to even step into church knowing what a hypocrite you've been. Can a wretch like me even be saved, you might ask. And the answer, dear brothers and, simple, uh, and sisters, is simple. Yes. After his resurrection, Jesus confronted Peter in his denial. He did it in the form of a question asking three times, making it symmetrical. Do you love me? And Peter responded affirmatively every time, well, then you've got work to do. Tend my flock, feed my sheep, build them up. See, Jesus has already dealt with the denial many, many, many times over, not just from Peter. And he took that denial to the cross along with all the other sins we've committed, along with all the sins I've committed, along with the sins of the whole world. Do you love him? Well, then you've got work to do too. Tend his flock. Feed his sheep. Share the good news. Tell other people about it. Don't shrink from claiming your Lord and Savior, including in public. 
He has called you to return from your denial because he's gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and because he relents over disaster. Your salvation is done. You are a forgiven child of God because just as he said, it is finished. Amen. And now may the grace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Stand watch over your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For behold, from this day all generations will call me blessed. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. During this time of offering, offering our lives as living sacrifices, we are grateful. And that's often what we do when we have heard the Lord's words, three readings usually, and then the sermon. Then we are filled maybe with gratitude. Realizing, being reminded about how Christ has loved us, which is the key to worship, gratitude. And number two is also humility. Uh, gratitude and humility, another key to worship. We're humbled to know that all we have are His and are gifted by Him. And we are the stewards of His gift. With gratitude and humility, we now sing the Kyrie. Supports us through both good times and bad. Forgive us for the times when our words deny you. Restore us so that the words we speak bless both you and the people entrusted to our care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Faithful God, through the ancient prophets, you call us to return to you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let these Lenten days be a time when, remembering how you relentlessly return to us in mercy, we return also to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. And our God, you delight in showing mercy to sinners. Amidst the turmoil we create when we wander from you, restore, confirm, strengthen, 
and establish us in your peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you.